If you guys will go ahead and stand for a moment just for reading God's Word, and then you can sit down. Um, that's okay. Uh, I'll tell you that it's really exciting to preach through the crucifixion. Um, and you kind of feel mixed about it. You, you feel sad because of the injustice of it, but then you're glad because God planned it for us to be redeemed, right? So it's like both ways, right? You, you look at it from a human perspective. So unjust. And the focus on his crucifixion, if you really think about it in the Gospels, a third of Matthew, a third of Mark is donated, uh, dedicated that last uh, week of his life. And then almost half of John is that last week of his life. And so the gospel message is centered on the cross. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to look at verses, I'm going to read from verses 28 through 1916 because this all deals with Pilate. We're only going to be looking at half of the verses here, the verse 18 through 28 today, and then later we'll look at the second half of it. And it reads this, Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed themselves. Sorry, I'm sorry, verse 28. I'm sorry, I was reading verse 18. I was going to say, that didn't sound like what I was wanting to preach today. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium, not least they should defile, be defiled, but they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out and said, and went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by which death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, I am a Jew. Am I a Jew? He asked the question, Am I a Jew? Your nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause... I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, Not man, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So when Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put it on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hell, king of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw them, him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. And according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid and went again to the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. 
Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has a greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover in the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, saying with him, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered them him to, to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that we are here today at Liberty Bible Church to hear your word. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus into the world for this very purpose. You sent him into the world for this very hour that we're reading about. You sent him into the world so that he might die for our sins. Because he is your lamb, you sent him. Father, we thank you for sending him. We thank you, Jesus, for coming. And as we look at this passage of Scripture, Lord, may it resonate in our hearts to see the injustice that is going on with your Son, the injustice that sinful men are trying to crucify your Son, and they are accountable for it. But also, Lord, may we see the gracious gift of salvation found in Jesus Christ our Lord. May we see that the Lord Jesus Christ died in sinner's place so that we might believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Lord, may you bless the preaching of your word. May we be able to understand the crucifixion more. May it resonate in our hearts, Lord. And if there's any here who don't know you, Lord, I pray that the crucifixion would just not be in their mind, but it would be in their hearts in the sense that that they would know you, the only true God you have sent, the Lord Jesus Christ and whom you have sent. Lord, we thank you for our time. We pray that you'd bless your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. I wanted to say that um, throughout the trial, there's five steps or five phases in the trial. And we looked at the first one uh, last week with Annas, the high priest. Um, Jesus was taken to his house, and, and this is recorded in the Gospel of John. Secondly, after that, it's not recorded in the Gospel of John But Caiaphas, the high priest, who was the high priest at the time, remember because Annas was the high priest from, I think, 6 AD to 16 AD or something like that. So he wasn't the high priest at the time, but Caiaphas was the high priest. And so they later come from Annas to Caiaphas, and he is there before the Sanhedrin. And there they sentence him to death. It's in the middle of the night. And there's just a glimpse of Caiaphas here in John. In verse 24, you see, Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And then then we have Peter's denial sandwiched in between there. And then, of course, we go to Pilate. So Caiaphas is only recorded that he is sent there here in the Gospel of John, but more information is given in the other Gospel accounts. And then after that, he goes before Pilate, um, and then after Pilate, he goes to Herod. Uh, Herod is in town because of the Jewish festivities, and Pilate wants to get rid of um, this 
Jewish group of people that are trying to crucify Jesus for no reason, so he sends him over to Herod. And this is recorded in Luke chapter 23. And really, what I am preaching is the first trial before Pilate, and then we'll look at the second trial that is next week. You get that? So Herod is recorded in Luke chapter 23. And we'll kind of briefly look at that next week. And then lastly, he goes back to Pilate, and that's the last one. The fifth one's Pilate. And so if you notice in our passage, the third and fifth are sandwiched together, and we don't really have the fourth one in the Gospel of John. Now, I want you to notice what we've already looked at. As I said, we looked at the first part of the phase of the trial with Annas the high priest, And so first the trial was before Annas in verses 12 through 14. And then we have uh, Peter's denial in verses 15 through 18. And then we have trial interrogation interrogation by Annas in verses 19 through 24. And then we have Peter's denial in verses 25 through 28, his second and third denial. And then we notice that he is taken to the praetorium to... He's led from Caiaphas to the Praetorium to meet before Pilate. You see that. So we've already looked at the first phase of the trial. And as I said, John mentions Caiaphas in verse 24 and also in verse 28. And you'll have to look at the other gospel accounts to read about that. So John brings in the third phase of the trial with Pilate, the Roman governor, And there are really two parts here, and I want you to notice this. Uh, Pilate questions the prosecution. So he's first going to talk to the Jewish people because they're bringing Jesus to him, and he's going to do a back and forth. He's going to go in and speak to Jesus because Jesus is within the praetorium, and then he's going to go out and talk to the Jews. So that's the first part is Pilate questions the prosecution. And then the second part is Pilate questions Jesus. So after he speaks to the Jews, then he starts to have this conversation between him and Jesus. And I actually think that this really shows um, Jesus even offering Pilate the truth in a, in a sense. He, even though Pilate's going to crucify him, Jesus tells him he's the truth. So let's look at the first part. Pilate questions the prosecution in verses 18, 28 through 32. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. And it was early morning. So it's been night. It's early morning now. But they they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to him, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the sayings of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by the death he would die. Now, before we get into it, verse 32 is showing you the providence of God, that this is how he's supposed to die. So we notice here that Jesus was taken from Caiaphas, the high priest, to the praetorium in Jerusalem. And the Jewish leaders found him guilty to die. Uh, Remember, Caiaphas is not completely recorded here in the Gospel of John. He's mentioned, but if you look over to Matthew... um, 26, 65 through 66, it reads this. You can read this. Then the high priest tore his clothes, that is Caiaphas, saying, he has spoken blasphemy. And he's, of course, saying that he is the son of God. What further need do we have to witness of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. So they've convened an illegal trial during the night. Uh, they were illegal when they went and got him, how they got him. And of course, they were illegal in how they questioned him with Annas. And then they were illegal in how they dealt with it with Caiaphas. And they say, he's deserving of death. So this is the location. They take him to the location of the officer of the Roman military. 
They took him to the headquarters for the Roman military government. And Pilate was generally in the area of Caesarea. If you look on a map, you'll see that Caesarea is not in Jerusalem, but rather is north of Jerusalem towards the ocean. And he's usually in Caesarea, but during the the Jerusalem feast, uh, Pilate was in town, and the Romans would bring their military into town just in case of a disturbance. As you can imagine, over a million people are coming to Jerusalem, and really, if you think about it, as all these people are coming into Jerusalem, Jesus is going to be crucified outside of Jerusalem on the main road into Jerusalem. Did you know that? So he's going to be God's lamb that is crucified to the world. So we have to keep this in mind. Some people estimate that 6 to 10% of the population in the Mediterranean world was Jewish. There's a lot of Jewish people. And they're coming into Passover. Over a million people, a couple million people probably. I'll have to look at the stats on that. But Josephus uh, records that there's, there's a lot of people. So that's why... Pilate is in town. And just so you know, uh, Pilate had a piece of Israel, and so did Herod, because after King Herod died, they split up Israel among different people to, to govern those areas. Remember, because King Herod, when Jesus was alive, was over the whole thing and was a personal friend, from what I understand, or knew Julius Caesar. So he's been dead for a while, right? So the Romans would bring their military to town just in case of a disturbance, and the Jewish people had the right to decree death, but not the right to execute death. So they could say, you're worthy of death, but not to execute it. So they could not kill Jesus, and the Jews hoped to bring Jesus in quickly without the crowds. So it was up to the Romans to execute the person. So what we see here is that the Jewish leaders bring Jesus to Pontius Pilate. The Jews waited outside because they did not want to be unclean by being defiled by the Romans. You remember when they mentioned that um, he mentions cleaning your feet off. uh, When he says shaking your feet off, Jesus says that because the Jewish people thought when they went to the Roman world, they had to clean their feet off when they came back because they believed that the Jewish, that the Gentiles were defiled. So the Jews were outside and they did not want to be unclean. Look here, it says, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Now I want you to look at 29 for a moment. It says, Pilate then went out to them. Think about this for a moment. The unbelieving heart is so wicked that you see it in this passage. Think about it. The God of the universe becomes a man, feeds people, heals diseases, loves people. He never sins. He never does anything wrong. And these people are trying to illegally kill Jesus. The hypocrisy is seen in that they will not go into the praetorium because they might be what? defiled, unclean. That shows you the human heart. They will kill an innocent man, but they won't go into the Gentile area that they might be defiled. And I think that what you see that is, is in false religion, in false religion, there's all these things you look at and you think, really? You can't see You can't see that that is sinful. Instead, you're making a big deal out of this. The human heart is the most wicked part of the physical world. Listen to Jeremiah say this. He says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Listen to Proverbs 30 verse 20. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wickedness. Because the human heart is so wicked that unless you have the Spirit of God, a lot of times you cannot see what? Your sin. I've done no wickedness. I don't see it. So they unlawfully went and got Jesus in the garden. They unlawfully had court between Annas and then by Caiaphas. Now they were taking Jesus to Pilate. Why are they standing outside? Because Pilate is a Roman and they don't want to defile themselves. The heart of man is so twisted that they will come to the most illogical, immoral things and justify it. 
And so do not be surprised when the world starts to say things that are wicked are virtuous because that's what the human heart does without Christ. They take the most wicked things and say, that is virtuous. It's virtuous to be a prostitute. It's virtuous to be immoral. And it's virtuous to be a drug user. Or it's virtuous to do anything other than honor the Lord. So you notice here, they bring him to Pilate. And look, he asks, what is, what is their accusation? Why are you bringing me this man? Look at verse 29. Pilate then went out to them because they brought him and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? Pilate is with Jesus inside. And so he's going back and forth to talk to the people. He asks the question, what is your accusation? Are they going to answer the question? No, they cannot answer the question. There is no true accusation against him. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing anger and hate in their hearts towards God. And look what they say in verse 30. They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. What they're saying is, please confirm our decision. We already made the decision. Just go with the pilot. In the other, other gospel accounts, they say, he perverts the nation. He forbids us to pay tribute to the emperor. He says he is a king. And I want you to think about that because they're trying to appeal to who? To Rome. Remember Caiaphas ripped his shirt because he claimed to be the son of God? This doesn't have anything to do with Rome. He didn't say those things. They're trying to get Pilate nervous. They're trying to tell Pilate, you better do what we want you to do or you're going to be in trouble, Pilate. That's what you see a lot in our society. People manipulate people and get them to say what they want them to say because of the fear of man. Really, they see they, what you see is they are appealing to things that Romans don't like. They're appealing to Roman rule, which the Jewish people actually hated. Right? They wanted to take it, get rid of it. They were saying, Pilate, Jesus is extremely dangerous. He could take over Jerusalem. And look at Pilate's response to their prosecution. Verses 31 and 32. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. This is really interesting. Pilate says to them to take him yourselves and judge him with their own law. The Jews make it clear that they want Jesus dead. Now, I want you guys to remember throughout the Gospel of John, when he claimed to be the great I am, Remember in the temple when he said, before Abraham was, I am. What did they pick up? Stones to what? To stone him, right? So could the Jews have stoned him if they would have wanted to? But they could have stoned him, but Jesus was not going to die that way. Now notice that in verse 32 that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. And of course, the prophecy of Isaiah 53 was a prophecy that pointed to the crucifixion. The Old Testament spoke about his death, and he told his disciples he was going to be crucified. Back in John 12, if, if you want to look there, you can. John 12, as he's riding into Jerusalem, right after that, he says this in chapter 12, verses 32 and 33, he says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw people to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. And so he's telling them, I'm going to be crucified. In God's providence, he was going to die by the Romans. In a specific way, a specific time, and a specific place. 
Pilate goes back to speak to Jesus. The focus turns from the prosecution to Jesus, and this section is between Pilate and Jesus. So now we go between that to Jesus. Now, I didn't, I wanted to say that they were accusing Jesus of saying he is a king and taking his words out of context. Remember, um, they actually told the Jews that they, when they tried to trap him to pay taxes to Caesar, I want to just highlight this. Show me the tax money when they ask him, should you pay taxes to Caesar? And he says, show me the tax money. And he says, so they brought him a denarius and he said to him, whose image and description is this? And they said to him, Caesar. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar what is the things that are Caesar's and to the things that are God, the things and to God, the things that are God's. When they heard these things, they marveled and left him and went their way. So they have all these false accusations. And not only that, but he offered salvation to the Romans. He was not there to take over Rome. Many people wanted him to do that. Remember, they tried to make him king here in the Gospel of John. After he feeds all those people, they said, let's hurry and make him king. And then he has to slip out. So let's look here at Pilate and Jesus' conversation. Pilate asks him a question. Look at verse 33. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Really what Pilate's asking him is, What is your plea? What are, they have this accusation against you. What is your plea? Are you guilty of what this group of people out here are saying? They want you dead. Are you an insurrectionist? Are you a zealot? And it's the zealots at the time, the history of Josephus describes them. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, three main Jewish uh, groups existed at the time of Christ, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. He also mentions a fourth group called the Zealots, who were founded by Judas of Galilee and Zadok the Pharisee. That's not the same Judas, obviously. Josephus notes that the zealots agree in all other things with the Pharisaic notions, but they have an invulnerable attachment to liberty and say that God is to be their only ruler and Lord. Of importance in the New Testament history, the zealots led a rebellion when Rome introduced imperial cult worship The great Jewish revolt began in 66 AD. The zealots successfully overtook Jerusalem, but their revolt was ultimately unsuccessful. And in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple, and a remnant of zealots then took refuge in Masada. And if you've been to Israel, you'll, you can go to Masada and you'll find that these Jewish people were there and then they built this huge ramp. It took them, I believe, several years to actually kill these people because they were so angry at them. And then by the time they got up there, they all committed suicide. So think about it. Jesus has no army. He does not look dangerous. He's all by himself. And the Jewish, the Jews wanted to make Jesus look like a zealot or, or a terrorist. I just kind of think it's funny. You just kind of think about this story and you think, how ironic, he's in the garden and he says, I am he, and they what? They fall down. And he says, I can call a legion, what? Of angels, and they what? Destroy all right now. Pilate's probably like, what in the world? And Jesus asked him, he, he asked Jesus' question, Jesus' response, look at verse 34, Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Kids are good at that, right? The older kids send the younger kids up to ask you a question. You're like, hmm, are you asking me or is somebody else sending you? A lot of people do that, right? I don't really want to ask them, so I'll ask so-and-so to ask him, right? So Jesus asked him, are you speaking for yourself? Is this what you believe? Or did others tell you this concerning me? And as you can think about it, we don't have this on video, but there's nonverbal action here, right? It's not just them speaking, but here he is. 
Is he really a threat? I mean, if you read Psalm 22 and you read Isaiah 53, he's willingly giving himself for a sacrifice. And remember, the troops already went and got him. He gave them no trouble. He was cooperative. He did not tell all his disciples to pick up weapons. Actually, the opposite happened. Remember, Peter takes this guy's ear off in verse 11. And what does Jesus do? So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into your, into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? I want you to think about that. I mean, these Jewish people know. They know better. But their hearts are ravaging wolves. They want him dead. Pilate, are you asking this or is it the people outside? Jesus is saying, I'm not a military leader ready to take over Rome. After Jesus answers, Pilate makes a comment here. Look at verse 35. Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? He seems to not like the situation. As you could imagine, he's probably confused and he's like, what is going on here? There's nothing wrong with this guy. These whole groups out here wanting him dead. And he's probably frustrated and angry maybe and, and just being like, well, what do I do with this? And he's not a fan of the Jewish people. They hate him. And he's trying to figure out what am I going to do here? And he says, am I a Jew? Pilate's saying, yes, I am saying this because they brought you to me. I'm not the one that brought you here. They're the ones that brought you here. They're the one that leveled this charge against you. Pilate is answering Jesus' question. He says, I'm not a Jew. It was a bunch of them that brought you here. Luke, Luke tells us that it was a multitude of them that accused Jesus, as, as Luke says, and the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they group of them began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is a Christ, a king. So Pilate asks him a question, what have you done? Why have they sentenced you to death and want to kill you? At this point, I'm not sure that Pilate completely understands what is going on, but right before he sentences Jesus in Matthew. It says this, Pilate knew that they had handed him over to him because of envy. Look at this in Matthew 27 and 18. For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. So he saw. He is not guiltless, right? He is guilty. He sees it. He knows that they have handed him over because of envy. So Jesus tells him something. He tells him what kind of king he is. He, he says, I am a king. And I want to tell you what kind of king I am. Look at verse 36. He says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not here. My servants would fight. So he acknowledges to him that he's a king. And remember when Jesus came to earth, he was already born a king. Uh, I want you to think about that. One of the longest ruling kings was Louis XIV, right? And he came to be a king at a very young age, but he wasn't born a king, right? Jesus is different than any other king. How long has he been a king? Forever. He says, you're right. I, my kingdom is not of this world. And if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight right now. So that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So he acknowledges that he's a king. And 
You remember, what did the wise men say to Herod? Where is he who is born king of the Jews? Remember, they come clear from what? The east, they're kingmakers. They come into Jerusalem and they say, hey, where is he who is born king of the Jews? And they give him king presence to recognize his kingship. And listen to what Micah 5.2 says, but you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, that's where he's born, right? Is Bethlehem Ephratah. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, you're insignificant, but you're going to be significant. You're going to be significant because of who's going to be born in your town. Yet out of you, out of you, out of all the towns shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel's who's going forth or what? From of old, from everlasting. And so Jesus existed for how long? Forever. Philippians 2 says he gave up his full glory to come here to earth and chose not to exercise his attributes so that he could become a man and die on a cross, right? So you see here, he says, yeah, I'm a king. He says, I'm not about making Jerusalem powerful and taking over Rome. If I wanted to do that, I could have done that. Remember when I was up in Galilee and I was feeding the 5,000, which was really 20,000, back in John chapter 8, and he said to them, he told them that he was not, he wasn't going to do this. It wasn't in John 8, but back in John, he says, there's no way I'm going to do this. Must have missed a, I don't remember that verse, but that's fine. Um, so you see here that some people already wanted to make him king. And in John 8, 23, it says, And he said to them, You are from beneath, but I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. So this king came from what? Another world? From heaven to earth? One commentator says this, The kingships of the world preserve themselves by force and violence. If Jesus' kingship finds its origins elsewhere, it will not be defended by the world's means. And it resorts to no force and no fighting. It is hard to see how Rome's interests are in jeopardy. Jesus says, if I was the king, my servants would be fighting here if I wanted to do it. I wouldn't have been taken in the garden. Jesus' kingship exists in the hearts of Christians today, but in the future there will be a Davidic throne. Jesus will reign and rule over the world, and there will be a thousand-year reign of Christ, but Jesus came to save the world from their sins. Jesus did not come to judge the world. The world was already judged. Listen to John 3, 16 through 19. For God so loved the world that he gave his Only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And then 336, he says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And notice that Jesus says something about the Jews also. They are the ones that delivered me to you. That's what Pilate says, they're the ones that delivered me to you. And this really fits the theme of the book, right? This fits the theme and the prologue in John 1, 10 through 12, when it says he was in the world and the world was made through him. That is, he made everything and the world did not know him. And notice this verse here in verse 11, it says he came to his own. That is the Jewish people and his own. The Jewish people did not what? Receive him. Or accept him. 
the owner of the Jews. They did not receive him. They did not become a part of his spiritual kingdom. A few of them did, but the vast majority of them what? Rejected him. They're the ones that are wanting to crucify him. It seems like at this point, Pilate is somewhat intrigued, trying to figure out what's going on here. He wants to understand more. Look at verse 37 here in John 18. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth, and everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Jesus has spoke about his kingdom, and now he gives Pilate more understanding. He says, the whole realm, the whole reason why I was born was for this purpose. He told him already that he was a king. He, he is the king of glory. He came to earth as a man. Remember John 1.14, and the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's full of grace and truth. He's the one that became a man in order to accomplish this. And he also, Jesus tells us throughout the Gospel of John that he came to this world. Look, look here, I'm, I have him up on the PowerPoint. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is what? In heaven. John 3.31. He who comes down from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Then, of course, John 6.33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the great I am that says, I, I, I am the bread of life. John 6, 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. John 8, 23. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. And of course, in the high priestly prayer in John 17, 5, after Jesus concludes his prayer for himself, he says this, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus came into the world as a king, the king of glory. He was the king of glory that left his throne and came to earth, and he came to testify of the truth. Jesus came to destroy Satan. He came to restore the world. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So notice there is an invitation to Pilate here. Jesus is bearing witness that he is a king. Yet Pilate is not listening because he's not of the truth. Pilate's not of the truth. Isn't that interesting? Jesus answered, look at verse 37. You say rightly that I'm a king for this cause I was born and for this cause I've come to the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, what? Hears my voice. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. This echoes back to John 10, doesn't it? My voice. Sheep hear my voice. Listen to John 10, 3. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Listen to John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they what? They follow me. The true sheep listen to Jesus' word and they take it in and they follow him because he's the good shepherd. His sheep will follow him. They, they know his voice. They love the shepherd. If Pilate was one of Jesus' sheep, he would have embraced what Jesus said and followed Jesus. Isn't this amazing? He, he's, he's presenting him as, I am the truth. I'm right here and I'm, I'm telling you I'm a king. And Pilate's reactions says it all. What is Pilate's response? 
What does he say in verse 38? Pilate said to him, what is truth? Who cares? He has told me about truth. Think about it. The God of the universe is right there. He's right there. And he tells him, I'm a king from another world. I've come for this purpose. And I've come to bear witness of the truth because I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Pilate, there is no salvation outside of me. Excuse me. A lot of Romans at the time had given up to their traditional pagan belief with respect to their gods. And sadly, Pilate had the truth right in front of him and he could not see the truth. And I think that this should give you encouragement, not that Pilate rejected Christ, but it should give you encouragement that when you go out and preach the gospel and you speak the truth, people reject it. Jesus, in bodily form, talks to Pilate in private, and this is Pilate's response. Pilate's dead in his sins. And after the conversation, Pilate sees Jesus' innocence, but he does not see that Jesus came to die on the cross for sin. Now he goes back outside and tells the group this. Look at this. He's told him he's a king. He's told him he's from another realm. What does he do? He goes outside, and when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. I find no fault in him at all. And this is so interesting. They, they have a whole mob that is trying to convict him, a whole group of them. And Pilate says, I've heard all your accusations and I see your envy and I see what you're doing and I went in here and had a private conversation with him and he's told me he's a king, but he's a king from a different place. And guess what? I find no fault in him. There's nothing true about what you're saying. You guys are a bunch of slanderers. You've come here and you're accusing him of all these things and all it is is a bunch of lies trying to manipulate me into crucifying him. There's nothing true about what you're saying. I find no fault in him. And really, if you think about this, this is echoing what John's saying. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's God's Lamb and He's what? He's perfect without blemish. And even this man, Pilate, is seeing it. I find no fault in him. There's nothing he's done wrong. He's done nothing wrong against Rome. He is perfect in everywhere, never sinned. And is God's sacrifice. And so as you're looking at this, it's echoing and showing you that Jesus is your perfect sacrifice. That He is your righteousness. That He is God's Lamb. That the Father sent Him. That He became a man in order for Him to die in your place. His innocence is seen. And it really echoes the Gospel of John. Even before we're to the crucifixion, we're seeing all this take place. Look over to John 20, verse 31. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have what? Life in His name. Now next week we'll look at the fifth part of the trial. And in between the third part of the trial and the fourth, of course, He goes to Herod, right? And then he goes back to Pilate, but the third and fifth one are what? Put together here for John's gospel. And that's how John wrote it. So we'll look at the second trial before Pilate. And that will be verses 29 through 19, 16, I believe. 
Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you, we want to thank you that you were innocent. We want to thank you that that you plan the hour, the time, as you said, that no one lays down his life but you. The Jews were going to stone you, but they couldn't stone you. They wanted to kill you, but they couldn't kill you. But you actually laid down your life yourself. And Lord Jesus, even when we're in eternity, we will not completely understand your grace in the depths of what you did on Calvary's cross. We will not understand that the God who knows all things and holds all things together became a man to die in our place and became our righteousness. But Lord, we do see that you're completely innocent. We can comprehend outwardly, maybe not inwardly because we're sinful. But we thank you, Lord Jesus, for bringing yourself to Pilate, for dying a death that you did not deserve in our place. We thank you that you are so gracious that you died in our place. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Lord Jesus, may we look at you being God's lamb, that you are the Passover lamb, that you are the Passover lamb and that God's wrath is passing over us because of you. Lord, may we seek to glorify and honor you throughout this week. And I pray, Lord, if there's some who don't know you, that they would confess you as their Lord and Savior, and that they would believe on the Lamb of God. In Jesus' name, amen.